Welcome to Tex Murphy Radio Theater. When we last left our hero, Tex had described the sinister tarot reading he and Chelsea had gotten at the Golden Pagoda. This, in turn, triggered the traumatic memory of getting shot later that night. But Rook and Clint aren't buying it. Accused, confused, and on the lam, Tex's only ally is Louie, who finally tells Tex the horrible truth. Chelsea is dead, and Tex is the prime suspect. And now, episode four, foreshadowings and a funeral. I'd never believed in intuition. Don't ask me why, it was just a feeling. Despite what Louie had told me, I knew Chelsea wasn't dead, but it seemed like I was the only one, which explained why the cops were looking for me. For the first time in my life, there was a bounty on my head, and that explained why, after I got done telling my story, Louie had to wrestle the phone away from Rook. But in the end, Rook and Clint agreed to both keep quiet about me, and Louie and I agreed not to beat them both to a pulp. I heel-toed it up to the Ritz Hotel and climbed the fire escape to my apartment slash office. I'd been a month behind on my rent the night I went to the Golden Pagoda, which meant I actually was now two months behind. My landlord Nilo, he didn't need a reward to turn me into the cops. Actually, he probably would have paid good money. My apartment looked like it had been ransacked, just the way I'd left it. I'd made a mental list of things to do, and the first two were a shave and a self-imposed bath. Once I'd cleaned up, literally and otherwise, I decided to lie on the bed and relax for a few minutes. Look, Donnelly, we know you killed your partner. I'm with the OSS. We're investigating the claims of the Nazis. I'm with the OSS. We're investigating the claims of the Nazis. I'm with the OSS. We're investigating the claims of the Nazis. Look, Donnelly, we know you killed your partner. I'm with the OSS. We're investigating the claims of the Nazis. I'm with the OSS. We're investigating the claims of a Miss Anna Anderson. It's somewhere in the North Atlantic, frozen in the ice. Oh, who in the top row? Look, look, we know you killed your partner. I woke up two hours later in a cold sweat. The nightmares were back. I made a pot of my special rejuvenating java and went online to find out more details on why I'd made the city's ten most wanted list. Apparently, my speeder had been found outside the city still burning. Charred bone fragments of a woman's body were inside and Chelsea's purse was discovered nearby. I'm no lawyer, but even I would have been able to convict myself. There had to be some evidence that I could use to clear my name. I decided to take a chance on the only person I was on speaking terms with in the police department. Well, if it isn't the Pandora detective, how's tricks? Can't complain, Mac. At least I'm not fat and ugly. Oh, stop. You're killing me. Oh, wait. I'm getting me confused with your girlfriend. Funny you should mention that. That's the reason I'm calling. What a guy. You could have confessed to anyone, but you chose little old me. I would if I could, Mac, but I didn't, so I won't. Uh, what was that second part? Using the smallest words possible, I told Mac why a confession was out of the question. After the disappointment wore off, he agreed that I probably wasn't the most logical suspect. Fact is, I know you didn't whack Chelsea. Hell, everybody knows you didn't. 
Well, not exactly everybody. You got set up, but somebody's dead and somebody's gonna get blamed. And as usual, you're standing there like a baby deer in the headlights. Your point being... The only person who's gonna get you off the hook is you. Well, Mac had always been a master of the obvious. But now I knew I couldn't let the cops take me alive. If I ended up in the pokey, I'd never make bail, and that meant I'd never be able to clear my name, and the conviction would be a mere formality. I thanked Mac for the tip, and I hung up. Hello? I'd never understood why, but I'd always gotten more than my fair share of obscene phone calls and wrong numbers. I mean, what were the odds of someone randomly dialing 0696969? -69? But I had a hunch this call was different. Someone was checking to see if I was home. I decided to get the hell out, but where was I gonna go? My speeder was charcoal, and I had just enough cab fare to make it to the Bruin stew. Now there's an idea. Sure, my f I got a car. You mean a speeder? No. A 74 Camaro. Souped up. Mag wheels. The works. You do know how to drive a stick, don't you? Uh, sure. Well, it had been a while since I'd driven a car, but it was just like riding a bike. It wasn't just my gut that was telling me Chelsea was alive. I remembered that my sponge bather had said something curious. How much longer we gotta hold him? I hear they finished up with the girl. And then there was the fortune cookie I'd found. I was certain it was the one from the Golden Pagoda. I'd opened mine and said beware of fortune tellers. But Chelsea had put hers in her purse. I was sure of it. And I knew she found me mysterious and just a little dangerous. But she also knew I was one hell of a detective. Maybe it was wishful thinking, but it seemed possible she'd left it for me to find. As I made my way through the streets of old San Francisco, I racked my brain trying to figure out who would want to frame me for Chelsea's murder and why. When you're a top-notch P.I., making enemies comes with the territory. I'd only made a few, but of those, J. St. Gideon, Lowell Percival, the Chameleon, and Jackson Cross were all dead. And Big Jim Slade, as far as I knew, was still somewhere making license plates and using soap on a rope. There were only two people I could think of that hated me and weren't dead or in jail. Frank Shimming and my ex-wife Sylvia. But Sylvia wouldn't do anything unless there was money to be extorted, and Shimming would have killed me, not Chelsea. I finally found my way back to where I'd been held captive for over a month. It was an old Victorian mansion, overgrown and dilapidated. It wasn't until that moment that I realized I was weaponless and faced with the same obstacles I'd had while escaping. Luckily, or maybe not, the house looked abandoned. Whoever had been there had cleared out in a hurry. There was a room stacked to the ceiling with medical supplies and closets full of clothes. The kitchen had remnants of half-eaten meals. There was even fresh pipe smoke in the air. I'd found the room where they kept me. The handcuffs were still hooked to the bed frame. I started in a room on the fourth floor. By the time I'd reached the ground floor, all I'd found of interest was a mostly full bottle of Jack Daniels and a pamphlet on an upcoming Fabergé exhibit. Then I found the only locked door in the entire house. Knock, knock. It took some finessing, but I was able to pick the lock. Inside the room, I found surveillance equipment, cameras, and a video disc player. Unfortunately, there weren't any video discs to be found, but experience had taught me to always look in the most likely place. Sure enough, there was a disc inside the player. I popped it back in and hit the play button. It was a video of a funeral, filmed from a distance, apparently by a couple of foreigners. Russian, maybe. As the camera moved around, I saw some familiar faces. Louis, Rook, Clint, Zach from the electronic shop, Crazy Gary, the vigilante vegetarian, even Nilo. There were some faces I hadn't seen in years. Ardo Newpop and Mrs. Lucida from the Slice of Heaven. And also a few other people I didn't recognize, but it suddenly dawned on me the funeral I was watching was Chelsea's. 
The video displayer was a cheap piece of crap from the electronics shop, so I decided to take a closer look on my high-tech equipment back at the office. I was just slipping the disc into the pocket of my overcoat when I heard a noise behind me. Who are you? Who are you? I ask you first. I am a representative of the Cassian faction. Now give me that disc! Why should I? Because I say so! It looks like someone's forgotten the magic word. All right, close your eyes and hold out your hand. Whoever this guy was, he fought like a girl. After I'd sucker punched him and scratched his eye, I grabbed hold of his hair and smashed his head onto the edge of the table, knocking him out cold. You picked the wrong P.I. to screw with today, pal. With the disc and pamphlet safely tucked away, I pulled out the bottle of J.D. and took a well-deserved swig as I swaggered out the front door. The Camaro was right where I'd left it, except I didn't remember parking it next to a bunch of police speeders. You're under arrest, Murphy. The building is completely surrounded. Now drop the bourbon and step away. <laughs>